Yes, hello everyone. I'm happy to present Reli, who is our speaker of today at our seminar. Reli is a geologist and geophysicist that is finalizing her PhD at our Department of Marine Geosciences. Reli has approximately 17 years of academic and professional experiences in the year sciences. Uh, her master studies uh, were done at uh, Ben Gurion University of Negev and focused on uh, stratigraphy and sedimentology of the upper Tsenomanian uh, of known Tamar cycle in the Negev. Uh, during her PhD study, she specialized in uh, seismic stratigraphy and 3D modeling that changes between geological and geophysical data sets. Uh, recently, uh, Reli joined the uh, Shefa Yamin, a mineral and precision stone exploration co company. And uh, today, Reli will talk about her major findings of her uh, uh, PhD. Uh, many thanks, yes, please. Thank you. Okay, thanks for hosting me and bearing uh, with this talk. Today, I present uh, some. Uh, main highlights for my PhD research uh, done here in the Marine Geoscience Department at Haifa. Actually, this is a conjunction uh, research between University of Haifa and the Israel Geological uh, Survey in Jerusalem. Today, sitting with us is my advisor, Amit Seger, Dr. Amit Seger. Uri Shatner, as you all know, is overseas. And uh, Tzvi Ben Avram uh, is my third advisor. And, uh, I want to take you to a kind of a short tour highlighting main issues in regard with this uh, uh, very fascinating study area of the Lower Galilee Basins. So uh, the talk uh, uh, the talk will, uh, will pass through these main stages along its way, according more or less to the thesis uh, episodes or main chapters or pillars. Okay, so we we'll start, our story starts with the Oligocene uplift and truncation, which was quite regional, quite even global in terms of erosion. Uh, it goes via the Miocene subsidence of basins and sub-basins across the Galilee area. Another minor truncation at the end of Miocene, which I will not focus at. And uh, the final echo of this talk will be the Pliocene shear and the cutoff of these uh, Miocene basins via their hearts. Uh, the, this shear crosscuts uh, these basins. So the study area, the Galilee, is located quite far from very uh, pronounced elements here in the Segev 2002 map. Uh, on both sides, sides of the Arabian plate. From north, uh, uh, we have the convergence between Eurasia and the then Arabian uh, African plate. Today we see it as a suture of a collision and as convergence uh, arcs and subduction zones. And from south, we have the Afar plume and the extensional regime lifting apart uh, the Arabian plate from the African plate. So these are the uh, far field effects. And the Galilee is located approximately 700 kilometers from the collision zone and approximately 2,500 kilometers from this extensional abdoming area of uh, Afar Blue. So getting closer, the Galilee is confined. It's really a narrow stretch, approximately 80 kilometer width. And it's confined between a large plate boundary, well known a Dead Sea Fort, 1,000 kilometers long, quite uh, combining these two elements in the north and south. And from the west, the continental margins of the Levant, which we are all very familiar with. My study area, as you can see, is quite an offside story in our uh, <laughs> uh, marine geoscience school. This, this study grew up together with the school. It took me some time. I know, but uh, it is an offside story, but still the saying pertains that once we were all covered by a huge ocean and sea, okay? So it pertains to the Galilee, of course, as well. So it is also one of its other problems is it is located in the midst of this Cretaceous large fault bed, also referred to as the Syrian Arc fault bed. So it's right in the middle, and this fault bed crosses it in a north-northeast 
direction. Looking finally at the geology, at the geological map of uh, uh, Snell and Weinberg of major structural elements uh, in the region. At the first glimpse, we see that the area is vast, is, uh, is mainly crossed by uh, faults. It's uh, very complex to look at at the first glance even. Uh, and the, I'm talking about these gray areas which are really a sedimentary basin. What we really see here is the alluvial cover, Pleistocene, Pleistocene, mainly Pleistocene alluvial sediments covering the main structure that is beneath uh, these uh, sediments. Also, we refer to the, the fault belt itself, the, rem the remnants of this fault belt, the Carmel, Menashe, Um el Fahem, and the uh, Gilboa, Shechem, Syncline, and the uh, Faria Anticline. This fault belt is being cross-cut by this chain of lower Galilean basins. Uh, looking at the relief of the area, it's quite boring, okay? It's 20 to 70 meters above sea level. <coughs> we do have the margins of these basins that extend up to 500, 550 meters above sea level, and some local highs among the basins themselves in between. So uh, how do we approach an area like that, uh, which is mainly flat lowing, uh, and, uh, and we, we really don't see the structure itself buried beneath. So of course we use various techniques. We call them in a large name the basin analysis approach, the GNG, we combine geological uh, and ge geophysical data sets together. So what I, I, uh, my work really was uh, to combine uh, these data sets into one sort of unified model, 3D model, uh, to decipher the area so that uh, the community, the researchers, will have a 3D cube uh, and uh, we could draw many, many uh, findings out of this cube. Uh, okay, so the model <coughs> base is 2,500 meter depth, deep uh, below us, below the surface. That is because the sharpest reflectors, the last clear reflectors, the deepest ones that I see in my data sets are uh, those of the Bina formation or more or less upper Cretaceous units. And the rooftop of uh, the model is the topography itself. What can we extract out of these data sets? We can extract key surfaces, isopack maps, geological sections, and whatever direction that we, we would like from the, at least from the Petrel uh, software. And the work was using Petrel and seism seismic data from uh, Kingdom combined and ArcGIS, all of this using the following, uh, I will go quickly through the data sets, boreholes, water wells, along with the uh, prospection wells, uh, above 500 water wells, 18 prospection. Luckily enough, uh, people looked for uh, gas and oil, many oil in the 70s and the happy 80s here, but they did not, of course, uh, find. Uh, at least they used it as a uh, lithological data. Uh, we call this structure the Gidon structure, previously called Gidon. Now we will refer to it as the Hayogev Mizrahi. I will uh, mention it several times. Uh, look at the shape of the Galilean Basin. I will show you many, many maps. I know the hour is getting late, but uh, uh, this is the, uh, our anchor, our uh, Afula, our anchor locations, Afula, Yokneam, Jenin, Bet Sheehan Basin, and Nazareth Range. So these maps are going to, to show up again and again, but from various aspects. So uh, I'm not, uh, of course, I'm not alone in the world. Many, many giants have walked here before. They still walk around, and my research is only part of a, an ongoing large research of uh, uh, Amit Segev and Volodya Lechovsky that work in northern Israel. And all these researchers, and all these researches and publications were incorporated into uh, the model via digitizing, and of course, inputting the data uh, manually, sort of, to get uh, the digital uh, appearance of the model. Seismic reflection data, well, we all know this uh, data set, and uh, it really provided the spatial extent of the information. It bridges between special data sets, outcrop data sets, geophysical data sets, and uh, borehole, borehole data. <coughs> so uh, this is the coverage, more or less, uh, 
uh, we get a good coverage, a coverage. some uh, areas suffer from less, uh, uh, less coverage. But uh, these are the main, uh, the main uh, components for the model. Okay, finally, <laughs> we read geology itself, and we see the columnar section of the Galilee. The time interval uh, takes us from upper Cretaceous, uh, referring to the model, uh, to uh, the approximately cover basalt, or even younger, you will see alluvial units of Pleistocene age. And uh, you see that uh, most of it is blank, most of it is, most, most of it is white, because we are going through a major uh, transformation in this period from marine realm all across the area into continental lacustrine slash fluvial sedimentation during Neogene times and to date. So I'm going to take you now to this celeste unit, to the so-called here Susita formation, evidence for Oligocene sedimentation, which was scarce in Oligocene times, uh, in Betchean Basin. <clears throat> you see, Northern Israel is uh, covered by very, very scarce uh, sedimentation, sediment outcrops, one being Betras, <coughs> Betras, above uh, Mishmar Ha'eme Kibbutz, few outcrops in the Southern Gulan area, and Northern jo Jordan. But we do have traps. Normally, us people, we don't like traps in life, of course. But geologists, in terms of truncation, they love the traps. And Bet She'an is such a trap that was deep enough back then in truncation times to hold the sediments and more important, preserve them. So there is a sketch going from east to west. It's a schematically only, of course, of the uh, Syrian arc uh, we viewed before in the map. Uh, Syrian arc mild fold belt, confined from both sides by basins. Uh, these are remnants of the shrinking enclosure closing uh, up the uh, Neotetis back then. So in the past 40 million years, we know that the Neotetis is going and uh, actually is vanishing, and we are left with the Levant Basin today in Mediterranean, and the Hordos Taiba Basin back then in Oligo-Miocene times, uh, to be pa part of a larger Mesopotamian basin and perhaps uh, co connected, we know that they are connected to the Indo-Pacific. So we are focusing even more on this little, little trap in Betchean Basin, which was deep enough to preserve the, the sediments. Coverage in Betchean Basin is quite good. Uh, we have a web of seismic lines. And uh, we also, uh, I, I also benefited from uh, seven water wells that were drilled between the anticline and the syncline. Well, this is a syncline. Today it's a mountain, a uh, Gilboa range, we call it. Uh, but uh, it's a Cretaceous syncline. In the, in, the, in the place where the anticline, Faria, meets the syncline, uh, seven drillings were made to reach the aquifer and uh, pump water. One of them also produced one of them also produced the um, seis synthetic seismogram that enabled correlation between seismics and geological data, and it enabled uh, tying up the data all across this basin towards the depot center. So we are looking at a seismic line that trends to the north-northeast along the Faria anticline plunge or Faria anticline axis plunging towards the Betchian Basin. Each seismic section that I show you has an x-axis uh, of uh, meters offset and a y-axis of seconds, the time domain. And uh, obviously, the datum is changing a bit across the study area. Betchian datum is uh, minus 150, whereas other basins, uh, datum is uh, sea level. So all these have been tied up. I won't uh, make you more tired than you are already. So, OK. Uh, you could track the plunge of the anticline, of the Faria anticline buried beneath the sediments of the Betchean Basin. Uh, the colored, colorful units above are neogene sedimentation, which we will refer to a little bit later. This is the Cretaceous plunge, the Faria anticline. And among them two, a sandwich in between, is the Susita formation. It is suggested to be a Susita formation from this work. 
And uh, these are scarce sediments from uh, truncation time. If we flatten the top of Suceta, the top of these Oligocene sediments, we mimic the truncation, the Oligocene truncation, and we could track uh, the reflectors still dipping towards the anticline, meaning that there is a sense of movement, a sense of syntectonics going on while truncation was all over. So uh, this truncation was also com com accompanied by localized faulting uh, during Oligocene. To get the close to real image of the Betjan Basin uh, back then, along with its depot center, the deepest place, to accumulate sediments, and we use the, I, I show you the top Mount Scopus uh, late Cretaceous structural map, okay? And, uh, and you see that the deepest color, the deepest blue, uh, means the lowest places. And we just saw a seismic line that touched this lower area. And uh, we do see the cellar that distinguishes between Harod Basin and the Betjan Basin. So this was relatively the back then topography close to it as much as we can since it's the basin floor. Yosin is missing. So the basin floor is synonym. Okay, uh, so the sediments input come from west to east towards the depot center. And making the, the story short by a little uh, sketch, a cartoon, uh, we are uh, going from uh, boring sedimentation, sub-horizontal, horizontal, marine sedimentation during Jurassic and Cretaceous. Of course, it's not boring, but it's another story. Uh, was folded by east and west, more or less, okay, general compression regime in upper Cretaceous times. Eocene sediments shut off the relief. They fill it up, uh, mainly the synclines and some of them were shed, shed off uh, from the peaks. And we get this picture that we just saw in the seismics of uh, Oligocene rare sediments <coughs> pinching out upon the Cretaceous relief in profile view. And if you look at it in a map view from above, we get the subcorp sense of this uh, truncation. And the next image, which is not so easy, but it takes you back to the map view of the truncation, it really shows you the youngest, mo the young the youngest units below the truncation surface, okay? In each location across the study area. Some of this uh, was taken from outcrops. The red uh, polyline, the red line distinguishes between the outcrops and subcrops uh, uh, areas. And we see that uh, the younger, the younger uh, formations uh, of that group, uh, for instance, the, the younger units uh, as opposed to a uh, more or the, the, as opposed to older units in Carmel area and in the heart of the Galilee and Upper Galilee areas, which are older. Of course, these were taken from outcrops. This is the special extent of the truncation. Look at Betjan with the uh, Oligocene tract sediments uh, lying upon a Cretaceous framework. Eocene is missing. If we look at the time that is missing in terms of the vertical, what is missing in the geological record using million years, we see that the blue areas are areas that suffered less than the from truncation, meaning uh, 20, 30 million years are missing, as opposed to uh, yellow and red areas that suffered more from the truncation. And this was done from a grid by these uh, information points in red that you see each point was uh, had the youngest unit below the upper units, uh, the, the oldest units above the, the truncation surface, and then the, the interval, the missing time, was uh, was uh, extracted. I, I must uh, refer to this map and to comment that there is another very big erosional uh, phase that predated the Oligocene. And this is the Upper Cretaceous. Uh, so-called Senonian uh, truncation that uh, Segev and Sass in the Carmel Mountain estimated to be approximately 200 meters uh, loss of rock column during the Senonian. So this is in the back of the mind, so the values are not that uh, big, probably. Uh, okay, trying to put it into a paleogeographic reconstruction, 
Gardos et al, uh, they were interested in the source basins for our gas findings, uh, of, of course, in the offshore. We all know that the gas findings track uh, some gas within the oligomyosin interval. This is a big interval in time, oligomyosin, but it sums up into 1,500 meters of sediments trapped in the sand lobes and the, uh, the outcome of the turbidites and canyons going offshore. But uh, no one really could point uh, the transition between oligocene to myosin. We also find these difficulties here in the Bechian and Kinarot basins. It's not so easy. Even the type section of Hordos basin did not reach the base of Hordos formation. So in terms of that, the Bechian serves as a, some gate to knowledge uh, as a trap that we do know uh, to track its base and top. But uh, Gardosh is, uh, Gardosh is, Gardosh is, Gardosh et al, uh, 2009 uh, reconstruction, uh, ignores some uh, main uh, question marks, such as what is the extent of the source basins in the east along the Mesopotamian or Transjordanian areas? And again, we come to the question regarding the coast line, which is not so sure, and we are not so, uh, even the reconstruction that were published uh, did not cross the Gilboa line, so to say, to the north, and we don't know really where the coastline uh, was at back then. So even the larger picture, another huge step back, and taking the large view, we see that we are as usual, in the Olympic Games and everywhere, in the Mondial, we are just a tiny dot, okay? We are part of the, of, of the Hordos to be basin. I will show you next the Miocene story of the basins. We are, the Bechian is part of the Hordos provenance, and the Hatseva was also drawn from Gardosh here, on top of Ziegler's huge uh, reconstruction all over the Arabian plate, showing Mesopotamian basins that uh, show us that sedimentation was quite varied back then uh, from marine via lacustre in Lagoon and Deltaic and even continental uh, sedimentation along uh, the massif. So to sum things up regarding this show, uh, it was not so short, but uh, regarding the religious implication, the other episodes will be a little shorter, I assure you. Uh, we are looking at the tip of a, a tip of, a conti of the continent of the back then Arabia-Africa continent, which was partially covered by the closing Neotethys with its two branches, one the Indo-Pacific arm and the other the Levant Mediterranean to be arm. And we see, and we just saw, uh, the Cretaceous uh, mild fault bed being uplifted and truncated. I did not get into details, but we, we uh, the whole thesis and the discussions uh, deal with the removal range of 50 to 1,300 meters, which means an erosion duration of approximately 7 million years at a rate of maximum rate, the maximum rate of 185 meters per million years. This more or less correlates with the work of Avni et al. 2012 uh, in southern Israel, Jordan, and Egypt, which they really were closer to the main mechanism of the Afar updoming uh, uh, mantle uplift. Uh, so it's still questionable, but these are the numbers that uh, come out of, the, of uh, my thesis. So this is the first uh, chapter. We are left with the truncation. We are left with the lowland area, a peneplain. And we get to the next uh, episode, which is the Miocene subsidence of basin and sub-basin across the lower Galilee. So you will see this heart-shaped uh, form all over, again and again and again, for many, many aspects regarding the tectonics. Now we get to the action, okay? Now vertical offsets uh, begin to show. Uh, I, I take you with me to the Miocene uh, uh, period. And uh, we see that the area is being faulted, syntectonically accumulating sediments, one of the key sediments, or it's not so sediment, but it is sedimented, is the lower basalt, which was the subject of the short talk we just talked about before. And uh, its top, its rooftop, surface map, shows uh, clearly 
uh, defaulting and the depot centers that are relevant uh, to the deposition of the basalt uh, flows in Miocene times. Basalt was flowing for 16 approximately million years up to 9 million years ago. And uh, it's a main player in the, I, w I will uh, divide the Miocene subsidence into two stages. So this is a main player uh, in the first uh, stage and also in the second stage of the subsidence. We will start with the um, seismic line that shows it crosses two sub-basins and an intervening high in between them, what we call Israel Valley, but we refer to in my thesis as Kfar Baruch Basin and the Fuller Basin. And there you get Mizra high in between. This is the high and this is one basin, this is the western basin. So it was done uh, on the path of the renovated, uh, so to say today, Rakevet Aimek, the train of the valley. <laughs> For us Israelis, uh, it means a lot. Uh, it has a lot of jokes around it, but it's nice. And uh, it crosses the valley uh, at uh, the heart of the valley, okay? And uh, this is Kfar Baruch Basin, Miocene Basin, and this is a Fuller Basin. And we could track the celeste colored horizon that is the RTS, the regional truncation surface, again, remind you of the previous episode of the Oligocene truncation. So we see that this horizon overlies other units in each place. In Kfar Baruch, it overlies the Avedad group. <coughs> in the Ayugev Mizra unit, it overlies the Judea group, whereas in the Afula Basin, it overlies Mount Scopus group. So there are some changes among different very proximal areas in the basins. If I flatten the celeste horizon uh, to mimic the RTS again, I see that Kfar Baruch was a low. Actually, it was the extension of the Menashe syncline. If we look back, uh, the Menashe syncline, Vitesha syncline, maybe, presumably, is, uh, we think that it uh, also shows in the subsurface of uh, Kfar Baruch uh, Basin. Some uh, researchers such as Gutman called it Nahalal syncline. Well, this is a syncline that continued to be low. How do we know it? Because in Neogene times, it still accumulated uh, uh, sediments. We see that by the thickness uh, accumulated here. We see that the Fula Basin was relatively high. It was, its uh, flow is a uh, Mount Scopus group, but it did uh, accumulate uh, fast uh, and it, it did it fast in uh, high rates, uh, sediments during both stages. So I tend to divide, I, I will use the, the lower basalt as a main key unit to decipher the structure of the, the, the basins, but I divide the stages of subsidence into two, the lower basalt and its time equivalent more or less Hordos conglomerate, and the clay, Sirius, Sabuna, Bira, Gesher, and the cover basalt in the second uh, subsidence uh, stage uh, that is coming, evolving from uh, the interpretation. So just a short look at the RTS surface map. Covering it is the top of basalt half transparent. So you could see, you could track the extent more or less nicely of the lower basalt. Here it extends more to the northeast towards the Golan. But, uh, but this is more or less the extent, as it was mapped uh, by me, of the lower basalt above the RTS. So you can see where it really accumulated and uh, settled down after it flowed on surface. So if we combine, uh, so, okay, okay, so just to <laughs> stress again, we use the lower basalt, it's a key unit since it's datable. Uh, Amit Segev dated it, uh, um, Gabi Shaliv, Gidoui Ber, uh, Alexis Rosenbaum, and uh, Amir Sandler. It's eight, it has as age constraint, as I told you before, and it shows us the structure. This is how it looks in Ginega in an outcrop. It is relatively weathered, it's not so fresh, uh, but it's the same composition as the cover basalt, and it also is known for its uh, fractures and veins filled with calcite and special uh, uh, weathering, uh, uh, weathering view, a uh, weathering uh, appearance. 
Uh, how does it reach the surface? In many, many ways. Most of them are uh, fault connected. I mean, it, they, uh, the basalt used the fault planes to uh, flow up to reach the surface. This, we see uh, an intrusion uh, near uh, Israel kibbutz. We see it near the Gilboa ski site. Uh, the irregular contacts with the Avedat group, just to get the sense of this unit that <coughs> flows and accumulates while, this, while the basins are sinking down. So it's syntectonically accumulating. Uh, and the, the, there, was, there, there is some portion which is explosive also with these magmatic phases, but most of it uh, uh, came to the surface as lava, as uh, to be uh, basalts. So surface extent of both units, I take you, uh, okay, there, okay, <laughs> okay, sorry, I take you back for the stratigraphy for a short while uh, to see the intercalation between the, this is the first stage uh, sediments, Hordos conglomerate and the lower basalt, interfingering, intercalating, all those really predates a bit, predates the lower basalt, uh, the type section in Borea cliffs above the Sea of Galilee, and these are the second stage sediments. So we are on the first stage, and we are looking at the isopath of these two formations while they were uh, accumulating in this first stage uh, of the subsidence. This is their spatial extent, the outcrops, the real axis was uh, between Poria and Barda, uh, uh, approximately Marme Fayad. Uh, here, the thickness reached, reached the highest uh, rates, the highest uh, numbers. And the isopack uh, shows it. The isopack map includes, in purple, the outcrops, the dips of the basalt and the conglomerate as they were mapped uh, from uh, the data, subsurface data, and it correlates with the corresponding outcrop data. So this is the isopack of the first stage of subsidence. Uh, together with this isopack image comes you the... You went a little bit too fast, can you... <coughs> ah, it's too fast. Okay. <laughs> you say a word or two on what you okay. see here. It's okay. So we, we see the main... <laughs> The main depot centers, the main uh, uh, places to accumulate sediments are the Bet She'an, all the way to uh, the area of Kinarot, Semach uh, region, uh, Afula Basin, and the area of Belvoir, the area of Belvoir Cliff, the Crusader Fort, above this uh, tilted block, uh, currently part of the tilted blocks in Eastern Galilee. These were the main depot centers. It was quite vague. It is connected, it is fault connected, but uh, the structure is not that uh, easy to grasp from the first stage, which is relatively extending over a large area. Take that into mind. Uh, another uh, little but deep subbasin is here in Ginga, relying upon the Nazareth fault. It's a half graben over there. And now, just because the time is Short, unfortunately, life is short. Uh, <laughs> I will combine it with the source map, with the assumed volcanic sources across the study area. Uh, I take, I, I took it from others. I, I rely upon many, many uh, researchers to incorporate their data, important data. Also, Amit Segev and Gidi uh, Bell and Shaliv, Dicker, and many more. Uh, that. So, uh, Schumann, they suggested these vents as the gateways to uh, the passat flows and to tufts uh, as well. And uh, we see the structures that are highly connected with this first stage uh, basalt uh, epoch, uh, drawn by uh, Dicker and Yair, and uh, the overall sense of west-northwest striking edifices. So looking at the cross-section to, to see both Miocene uh, stages of subsidence, <coughs> this combined section also shows you the variety of seismic data. I had some uh, higher high resolution data sets as opposed to low resolution data sets and we had to deal with it to incorporate them all on the uh, same platform. And here again in the celeste horizon, 
the oligocene truncation surface, the RTS, or close to RTS surface mapped, uh, it, it divides the Cretaceous and Eocene sedimentation from the Neogene uh, basins uh, themselves. And we see that they, these basins are intervened by local highs, local accommodation zones, local highs uh, that, were, uh, that were high already in the second stage of uh, the basin subsidence. So uh, this is along the basin axis, and we do see some uh, northeast confinement of the basins. Second stage uh, uh, subsidence could be deciphered if we flatten this time the top of Bira formation, which is upper Miocene, uppermost Miocene. And if we flatten it, we mimic the flat lowing uh, area back then that enabled marine invasion. I'm not getting into details with this part, but it's written in the thesis as well. Uh, this flat land enabled the marine invasion, and after that uh, came the cover result flows that covered the area, peneplain, uh, or covered this peneplain, and they reach only 10 to 15 meters in a full area in Migdala Emic. So these are the cover results that we are all familiar with from uh, the Golanites, but uh, in, the, in the Israel Basin, they are a bit minor in terms of uh, existence, accumulation and survival. Uh, so these, again, are the sediments. This is the first stage, the lower basalt. The hordus a bit predating it, intercalating with the bas uh, basalt. Above them, the second stage sediments of clay series, also Um Sabuna, which I not show today, and the uh, Bira, and the cover basalt. So the ice, okay, and the iso, the isopach of the second stage shows a more a complex uh, image, but a more defined, more or less defined uh, depot centers. A fuller basin is very deep, uh, as we saw in the flattening of RTS. It accumulates uh, the second uh, stage uh, sediments of Bira, Gesher, Cover Basalt. Um, Sabula and Clay Sirius uh, uh, here. The Kfar Baruch uh, Basin. The Kharod uh, Basin is confined to the area of Bet Alpha and Heftiba. Uh, it's a half graben on the Gilboa mountain. We refer to the Kharod Basin as a graben. We normally refer to it as a graben. But we see that it's not such a graben. It's a deformed half graben. And it has a very uh, large uh, fault that cross cut it, as you can see further on, uh, in a diagonal uh, direction. And uh, of course, the Bet Shean continues to be a major depot center, but uh, very uh, now localized and deep. Really, which is the, maybe the small basin that you lost, the small deep one? More to the north? This, this, ah, okay, and others in the eastern Galilee, uh, the, the Belvoir area, and this is the uh, east of uh, Moledet, between Moledet and Hamadia, is another on the Tzvaim block, is another, uh, a lot, uh, the Lira thickness here, which is a uh, high uh, values. So this is the second stage of basin subsidence. If we, if we look at the structural, uh, structural map of top of that, we, we visit again, we see with our eyes the intervening highs that we looked at when we saw the combined section. We, I tell them, Sdena Chum, Navot Israel, Ayogev Mizra, and Tivon block. And Tivon is uplifted. And this is, okay, this hard check is my study, of course, and we will see how it goes to the west. It's not an excuse, but other people they uh, worked there. So uh, this is the how it looks. And now from this, you, you, you can see easily that it kind of narrows towards Tivon, towards the Carmel block. And it kind of fits the model of Ford that, uh, that produced a, a suggestion for the overall neogen since Dead Sea Fault activity. 18, 15 million years ago, a solution to the geometrical relationship between Carmel Gilboa fault line, the offset along the Dead Sea fault, and the trans tension that is a result of them both. 
extending the eastern areas in relevance to the western areas. So it's a differential extension, 7% if someone read uh, his uh, publication, 7%, 5%, and 0% of Shor Haifa. So uh, it kind of fits, okay, uh, we validate what Fon suggested from the subsurface. Uh, and uh, just a glimpse, just a short look at the two stages. The first one being quite vague with an axis uh, of deeper center uh, along Korea to Marma Feyad or Bardala area and basic fault. And the second stage, which is much more uh, localized and including many half grabbings, uh, basically uh, the major fault oriented to the Northwest, but not only to the northwest, some auxiliary faulting which is perpendicular to the overall northwest trend of the basins and the intervening highs with the stripes uh, between these uh, little basins. So, this is the second stage of the subsidence. We reached the five million years ago stage, and that brings us to the Playa Pleistocene shear of the Miocene Galilean basin. So I use here a reconstruction from the Hatay base in Turkey, up, uh, upstate Turkey, uh, up north. Uh, it fits the Galilean case as well, although we are on a branch of the Dead Sea Fault. Also, the Hatay Basin is on a somewhat uh, harsh uh, tectonic uh, area of convergence, but it's also off uh, the Dead Sea Fault. And we do have the same, we suffer from the same disease of strike slip faulting that cross cuts uh, the Miocene basin. So the overall fault uh, map produced is that one. I will sharpen it, sharpen it a little better and highlight this area where the, you will see the Kishon River, it cross cuts the Ayugev Mizra uh, host, the Ayugev Mizra high. It bridges it out in what I think is the right step over area, compressional area. Uh, and uh, some people before also, Rochten and his group, uh, suggested that this area experiences compressional regime. And the Y, the major displacement, the Y uh, path is going uh, between the Gilboa Cliff and Yokneam and over to the Carmel uh, Cliff that we are uh, just sitting on uh, upon in this block, uh, in the heart of the basins, but all of these faults are connected to the overall deformation during the Pleio Pleistocene. And I'm not the first to suggest, to show, but uh, some of these faults are new and uh, newly mapped from, uh, f of course, from the, de the data sets that I mentioned. Another, uh, another big fault is the Bet Keshet fault which others mapped, Zilber, Zilberman's group in 2008 proposed a half dome here and the right sense of movement, but the overall sense of movement, the PDZ, the primary deformation zone, is involved with the left sense shear, and there are very uh, uh, much arguments about the amount of offset, from a few kilometers to hundreds of meters. For that, I did not come up with evidence for the horizontal Markers, but I do find them as uh, I find the sense of the horizontal uh, shear from the seismic data and flower structures that I know. So we do see large faults that transect. From, this is a geological section that is coming out of the model since I have the key surfaces that I mentioned, and we have the two stages of the subsidence. On, the, on this uh, long uh, geological section that cross cuts, the, the primary deformation zone is directed like that, and it cross cuts it, so uh, we, we are able to notice the, the Akada fold, which is right sense, this fold of uh, horizontal movement, already SAS tracked uh, its right sense uh, outcrops in the Umel Fahem uh, range up here, but we see it also in the subsurface. I don't see the markers, but I see, I take SAS's uh, advice and I see it in the seismic data as a flower structure. <coughs> we also have vertical offsets, uh, flips, uh, during the Pliocene times, and the sense of movement changes and flips, and it fits also analog modeling of restraining bends. 
primary deformation zones of restraining bands. You use the A, B, C, D, and it kind of fits a suge uh, suggested modeling done by uh, McClay and Bonoa. Okay, I'm going to pass. We don't have much time. And uh, uh, I'll show you again the lower basalt, top lower basalt structural map. In this uh, configuration, uh, okay, in the thesis it's very well uh, described uh, the sense of movement and the types of uh, faults. Uh, the lower basalt shows us the overall sense of northwest coast cutting, faulting during the Pliocene. Uh, and and uh, it seems that the basins and highs follow that trend. So uh, if we look now at the uh, at the echelonic type uh, of uh, faulting that we have in the western part of uh, Kfar Baruch Basin, just approaching the Tel Kashish block, uh, you know, uh, near Tishbi Junction, uh, near uh, Yokneam, Tel Kashish, the, the gateway to the corridor of the Kishon between Carmel and Tivon uh, Hills, uh, this is a very deformed area, and we look at the margins of Kfar Baruch, both from the north we see a uh, compressional uh, evidence, uh, one kilometer, a few hundred meters width uh, compressions, along with normal faulting of setting 100 meters, the lower basalt, top of lower basalt, post minus in the formation. And we look at the other side, uh, at the southern uh, margin, and also the Yokneam fault shows a similar uh, appearance, and it fits also uh, uh, Michael Lazar's PhD from the Kalia Fault and uh, Jericho Monocline. We see features like that in Hula Basin. We see it in Kinarot Basin in Tsurieli's uh, uh, MSC, and uh, Weinberger and uh, Shatner in Hula. And these are all, of course, connected to the Dead Sea Fault. So here we are on the branch of the Dead Sea Fault, but the largest splay in the land of Israel, at least, okay? So, and we see this minor, although uh, clear, a compressional features along with the Pleistocene deformation. If we are brave enough, I'm for sure not, but if we could uh, just extend these faults down into the earth, uh, we could think about seismogenic uh, uh, places, seismogenic routes. Others did it. Uh, analog modeling of uh, McLean and Bonora shows the map view that I showed you before. They crossed it in uh, various, uh, of course they use uh, the lab, but the results closely uh, are similar to the Galilee case. And then if we look at the what, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to share you with my thoughts regarding the area and uh, to see how it fits this seismogenic hypothesis maybe. So we follow, we start with uh, what looks like horse tail splay. Freund was the one to go to New Zealand and study about it and suggest that from the Hope and Alpine Faults. And I think we have something that resembles in the area of Mechola, Bet Shean Basin. We have similar splays uh, by Zaltzman from the western part of the uh, Sea of Galilee. That's for the preliminary stage. While the Dead Sea Fault was beginning its life, its offset, its concurrent movement, later than that, PDZ uh, formed across the area with this oval, with this oval shaped, uh, uh, shaded uh, shape uh, that signifies a step over and a compression uh, going that way. Th that this is the direction of the stress field. And later on, the PDZ was much uh, established and uh, uh, the intervening highs show up. If I try to put it in a strain ellipse, I see that the compressional field is, uh, fits the more or less east-west or east-southeast trend, and the, and the major extensional regime still pertains to the north-northeast because the area stays low. It's not the uh, Himalayas, so to say. It stays low, okay? The area still experiences the major extension but the price, the price in shields it off, including a uh, compressional component. So we see the auxiliary, the R-tag, uh, antithetic uh, deformation, along with the main deformation that goes on a west-northwest or west uh, sense, north-northwest, uh, west-northwest sense uh, 
of the uh, path. And uh, how far does it go to the west? Well, uh, Segev and Sass map the Carmel, and they show evidence for horizontal shear across the Carmel, examples being Achotrim Fault, Shalala Fault. So uh, obviously, some of the deformation crosses the Carmel into the offshore where Ben Gar and Ben Avram were mapping the extension of uh, this deformation uh, from the Galilee Basin across the Carmel into off the offshore. Here comes the question when was lastly the Carmel uplifted and other uh, question marks that still, still pertain. But this is the suggestion, the overall suggestion. And if we look at the heart of the basin, one, two, three being Sden uh, Achum, uh, the, the big step over of Ayogevni's <coughs> and three is Tel Kashish. If we look at it in terms of earthquake activity, we see a close fitting whereby the largest uh, earthquake from uh, 1984 from GII catalog in the midst of this great shaded uh, oval uh, shape by uh, John uh, produced a focal mechanism solution of a left sense shear, of a horizontal shear with uh, some vertical component. And it's in the midst of this uh, faulting web uh, that was mapped. And I think that part of the deformation does cross uh, the Carmel to the offshore. It might contradict some of Uri's publications, but we are on the same boat. And uh, if, we, if we draw down, if we draw down the faults, and we do there, uh, there might be a connection down there in the, okay, crust, deep crust areas in the eight kilometer depths or so, 10 kilometers, as suggested by Shamir in 2007, and uh, as a seismogenic zone. Other researchers, such as uh, Nadav Wetzler, probably are going to face uh, and help us uh, further resolve uh, this uh, complicated, as an excuse, but uh, in real life too, uh, area. So uh, to sum things up, I will sum it in a cartoon. Uh, we are looking at a very weak zone uh, considered as part of the then Sirhan Azrak uh, Graben known from uh, uh, eastern more, more uh, parts of Arabia over uh, Jordan and southern Syria. And uh, this uh, weakness feature of the lithosphere is actually a primary deformation <coughs> zone that develops all through the Oligocene into the, well, into the Cenozoic times, into the Neogen where the basins are first uh, extended, then transtensionally uh, deformed while extending more. And then the Dead Sea Fault, while stage two was on, uh, started to act, started to horizontally offset the area, to truncate it, to divide Arabia from subplate Sinai. And our study area, our case is, uh, you know, over here is a little case study of big, big issues surrounding it. So it kind of documents all this big, big activity on the western deep of the Arabian plate. Before I thank you guys for being brave and suffering and bearing with this talk, I would like to thank, of course, my advisors, because this is kind of a closure, although they did not read the final manuscript. <laughs> and I would further like to acknowledge my two dear friends, uh, very good geophysicists, Anat Kedem and Devlin Tesjan, that uh, helped me a lot. Uh, they spared their precious time on parts of my study, uh, helping me to combine the geophysical and geological data. And all this long list of good, good, hard people that helped me technically and uh, generally, and all of you guys and uh, all of my friends and colleagues. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. We have the time just for one question. Uh, please, uh, is there any questions? <laughs>